All right, we're back for part two of our conversation with uh, Terry Considine, uh, Dan Schmidt and I are, and uh, Dan, w- uh, Dan wants to grill Terry about something. <laughs> no, not necessarily Dan, grill, but that Dan is probably up on a point on many that Terry, Terry made about uh, sort of one of the gifts of strategic philanthropy. There are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uh, sl- uh, sl- arrows uh, that get thrown from the bow at you, but uh, uh, do you, Terry, what's your opinion about sort of the, the short-term character of uh, some of the things that have gone on in philanthropy? And I'm thinking here in particular, the sort of intersection of uh, politics, not that that isn't there because of public policy, but uh, does, that, does that in any way, in your view, perhaps at least provide an occasion to maybe uh, think more short-term than, than, as you say, keep to your values, your principles, and look at the long-term uh, without a jaded eye? Well, I, I I think I think two things. I think I think first of all, um, life this is is this, the long term is a series of short terms, and uh, that we can't look at the long term in a way that gives us a pass about doing something in the short term. And the uh, there are plenty of urgencies and things that need to be addressed today, and we ought to get started. And so I'm I'm as uh, pulled by that as as anyone else is, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, I think the second thing is the the uh, issue of of uh, politics being increasingly funded by uh, not for profit institutions, and and I think that uh, in in large part may be um, understood as as not true philanthropy. In other words, that's a tax plan to accomplish a political goal, but it, but it's it's it uh, complies with the Internal Revenue Code, but it, it's, it's not truly uh, philanthropy in the sense that we've used that. But even so, we, we live in a world where um, a, a lot of people's uh, values are driven by politics. And in some cases, that may be filling the vacuum left by the contraction of the role of, of, of religious faith. But there are people who feel about global warming or whatever the issue of the day is, uh, in, in a uh, powerful sense, and, and that has a uh, political component to it. Good, thank you. What could be done about this, Terry? Some are proposing reform, uh, which would maybe impinge upon in ways that make people uncomfortable, donor freedom, or you know, we try to pay attention to these things at the Kibbing Group. But uh, if, if politicization is bad and in tension with charity, if not violating it, what, what could be done? Well, I, 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 um, uh, I don't know that it's a bad outcome when people disagree with me. <laughs> and, and so I, I, I would defend their right, uh, they being donors, uh, to spend their money in advance of their causes. And uh, doggone it, they do. And I think that that's, uh, that, that's a right thing. So I'm not I'm not uh, attracted to the idea of the government uh, deciding what uh, uh, activities are particularly philanthropic versus uh, others that are not. But to the extent we differentiate between the two, uh, I, I just make the point that a, a person can organize their financial activities to advance a, a political outcome in part by spending money in, in what was, quote, uh, philanthropy. Yeah. Uh, what's changed in the nonprofit world in general, I guess, and philanthropy in particular, since you, I'm going to say, since you joined the Bradley board, I know your experience in philanthropy is longer than that, but what's, what's in addition to the politicization, I guess, which you, you pointed out, what, what, what has uh, changed? What's going I, I think, on? I think, I think the biggest thing, uh, and it's, it's sort of the obvious one is, is scale. The, the amount of money uh, that has been mobilized uh, in, in philanthropy is staggering. And, and I, I regret to report uh, how much of it is, is uh, spent by our, our, um, our, our, our friends on the left. Yeah. And the um, Bradley experience is, is, is relevant. We were uh, relatively large when I joined the board. We doubled in size over that time period and we were left far behind. <laughs> so it's just uh, the, the, the stakes are higher and um, and I think that's that's um, that's probably the biggest missed opportunity. I, I think that that the Bradley Foundation 
had during during my time, and it, it reflects on me because I had plenty of opportunity to influence uh, that, but I was unsuccessful in in um, in, in articulating a different uh, concept where we could mobilize other resources. But today, um, and you both joined the board or joined the foundation before I did, that was probably the early 90s and um, or earlier still, late 80s, early 90s. 86, I'll speak for Dan, 86. Okay. Okay. 86. In okay. his case, yeah, I was in high school then. But <laughs> well, and I was 12 years old. But yeah, the, yeah. Uh, but no, when when uh, in '86, so I came about a decade later, and we, we we it was an enormous enterprise, and and today, if you're objective about it in terms of dollars, we're we're not, and and so we punch above our weight, and that's that's as we should, but I think we have an opportunity to uh, mobilize uh, more capital, and to to raise more capital, and. Um, and that that's something that still needs to be done. And what uh, so uh, how how about because uh, I, I, well, I know you've had some ideas, but that that you know the ratio I think is different. Uh, we'll just say left right to make it simple from when right, oh, the nineties. The ratio is getting worse. You're subsidizing this with the exemption. It's no, I, I don't agree with that. That that that's a uh, that's a. Um, I would say that's a leftist uh, vocabulary yeah. that has the premise that the money belongs to the government uh, and they will choose what parts we can retain. I would say the money belongs to the person who made it and uh, they should be free to spend it. Um, and so uh, we're not subsidizing anyone. Well, they but, can but, spend it without the exemption, LLCs and so forth, which might be the future of philanthropy. Well, I, 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 I think it, it, if there were no tax advantage, People would still be philanthropic, and and uh, but I just uh, 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 I, and I think there can be a public policy that says it's a good idea to encourage philanthropy of right and left, and to that extent that's a broad encouragement. But I I don't feel that you and I are subsidizing the Ford Foundation by what they do or the uh, Packard Foundation or or some other foundation that whose whose um, politics are a little bit to the left of ours. And uh, that that that's um, theirs to decide, but I just I just note that that we're we're left behind, and that uh, if if we're to remain uh, relevant, we have to be much more effective than the others, and we it wouldn't hurt to have more capital. Yeah, you know, along those lines, Terry, uh, conservative philanthropy you start talking about the sort of nuts and bolts of it, but also larger issues, as you mentioned earlier. There are these, you know, instant kind of things that you can deal with, which can have the impact uh, on uh, issues long down the road, some of which happened at Bradley. So it's always, do you have, now I'm asking just for your sort of instinct uh, with all the experience you have, not just in philanthropy, but all the things you've done in your life, including your early education. Do you, do, is there anything different? I mean, history, of course, you find redundancies all the time. Is there anything particularly uh I don't know if concerning is the right word, but agitates you a bit with respect to thinking in the long term, not forsaking the short term kind of things you need to do to get to and solidify longer term principles and values. Is there anything that bothered you, not so much in conservative philanthropy getting overrun, but just the way the culture is going and society uh, that, again, it, there's going to be similarities. We know this, go back to the 60s and we can find some of these things, but just to, based on your experience, some things that make you a little bit nervous uh, about sort of uh, holding the line, so to speak, Terry. I'll say two things. Uh, uh, one is I'm, I'm reading a, a wonderful biography of Andrew Jackson right now, and it was published in the last year or so and is written during the Trump era. And, and the author is quite uh, uh, aware of the comparisons between the two. And, and so to a certain extent, uh, there's a lot of repetition and, and the world uh, of, of, of Jackson and the world of Trump are uh, have more in common than we, we might first think. But, but what is different today is that in, in, in comparison to most history, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm only being cautious because I, I know that history is vast, uh, there's less agreement on that some things are true 
and and there's certainly less agreement that that um, faith in God is is true, and and so uh, if if you think of of um, a world where people have uh, an interest and they think therefore that must be granted because it's there, it's, it's it matters to them. That that's that shows a lack of awareness or thinking about the rest of society and polity that that uh, the Greeks and philosophers since would would have, have uh, thought not 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 good and 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 many of the issues that come up today really at their heart have i have my truth you have your truth and we don't have to agree on it because it's true for us but that is a nihilism that that makes it very hard to have um meaningful conversations because we can't know what the content of the word or idea is for the other person and so i i believe in a universal truth i believe in in uh, a, a religious truth and I, I don't have to be denominational to have those views. And, and that's harder today, that is harder today. Well, Terry Considine, uh, before we thank you, I just wanna let you know that I've uh, spotted an empty space on one of the shelves behind you where the giving review mug that we're gonna send you can put. Uh, so that'll, for, that's our token of thanks, but uh, let me also verbally, orally, uh, thank you here for joining us today. Well, your dear friends, I wish you luck with what you do, and I, I know you'll be very good at it, and I look forward to my mug. So thank <laughs> you. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks, Terry. Thank you, Dan.